Uh, my name is Michu Huang. I'm the co-director of MEG at USSD MEG Center and um, was uh, radiology and ECE and also with VA. So uh, MEG is my major interest, both you know, in the research and clinical service. Uh, before I jump to the main topic today, which is MEG source imaging the forward problem, inverse problem, let me give a, spend just one minute or two, give a quick overview about what I covered the first lecture. Not gonna be, you know, on the, try to cover everything, but the, the key point, so I can uh, build on those points and give the first, give the second lecture. So basically, you know, the, uh, well, the, let me see the, um, I start with uh, something. Okay, this, this slide. So basically, um, in MEG is a functional imaging technology where measuring the neuronal current signal from the gray matter neurons. You know, MEG is insensitive to what happened in the X potential, which is a presynaptic action potential in the Y matter. Instead, MEG is sensitive to the synapses in a post uh, synaptic potential and uh, in the gray matter. And uh, MEG, we, we, we cannot detect signal from single neuron. Instead of looking at the, say, the cortical columns, the primal cell, uh, in the order of a few hundred thousands when the firing synchronously and they generate this measurable MEG signal. MEG signal is totally transparent to the brain tissue, you know, and including the skull. So with no distortion. That's the reason MEG, not only we have one uh, millisecond time resolution, we also have a two to three millimeter spatial resolution because everything is transparent to the MEG field. To take a measurement of MEG field, we need two things. Last time we talked about our best you know, six layer magnetic room. And uh, many of you already visit our site. I think that that's quite impressive. 26 metric times, two, uh, two feet thickness X, Y, Z. It's the best shooting room in the whole world for MEG. The second condition is we need a very sensitive sensor. This is a sensor we talk about the squiz and the MEG superconducting quantum interference device, very nice uh, acronym. I think it's originally given by a physicist from uh, uh, UC Berkeley, his name is John Clark. And the school sensor is based on a discovery um, by Brian Josephson, and uh, they called it Josephson and Johnson. And Josephson won the Nobel Prize in 1973. So that's the image sensor show over here. Oh, that's a story behind uh, Brian Josephson. After he won the Nobel Prize, he, he made an announcement that surprised everybody. He, he, he declared he's going to switch his interest from a uh, low temperature physics, which is, uh, and uh, he, he get his Nobel Prize to something totally different, you know, like a neuroscience. Okay. You know, and uh, many years ago, I was a keynote speaker at the MEG uh, annual meeting at UK. And uh, I was, you know, looking forward to see him sitting in the front row because he's such an important and uh, a scientist is going to contribute to the entire MEG field. I couldn't find him, and uh, you know, and that, uh, and then ask people, you know, and uh, what happened to him. You know, they gave him the story after he switched his interest from uh, MEG physics and uh, from, from uh, low temperature physics to neuroscience, and uh, he, you know, his influence is just going down. You know, and uh, so if you talk about you know graduate school students in physics department, everybody knows. Uh, Joseph Junction, I really know Brian uh, Josephson. We talk to, to a neuroscientist, almost nobody knows his, his work. So be careful, you know, want to switch your career. But of course, he no he won Nobel Prize. It doesn't matter for him. Uh, for MEG, it was the, the shooter room with the virus sensitive sensor uh, squares, we can detect the MEG field show over here. And then today, we'll talk about how it goes from the sensor space, which is outside the brain, to map the activity into the brain, you know, figure out, hey, what part of the neurons are firing? So what the MEG source imaging give is just a hotspot. You know, of course, to see exactly where they come from, when you superimpose the MEG, which is hotspot, on top mm -hmm. of the anatomical imaging, in this case, we get from the anatomical MR, which is the, the gray background. So we always superimpose our MEG activity to the anatomical imaging MRI. So MEG is functional imaging. MEG is not 
in any way to replace the structural imaging. Images add on the you know an <laughs> anatomical imaging and try to tell us, hey, what the group neurons are firing during that specific moment to give the image signal. So it's a nice combination of time and space. So let me move on. Uh, last time we also talked about a serial room, we also talked about you know the school sensors and uh, spend some time to talk about the next generation of MEG called OPM, optical pumping and mitometer. And, and now talk we we'll talk about you know why MEG is better than EEG because MEG is insensitive to the head tissues uh, connectivity or EEG and the skull is really the main enemy because the connectivity of skull is so poor, everything smears out. We we'll also talk about a lot of uh, uh, MEG pre-processing technology and uh, the signal space projection, which is like PCA-based analysis versus the, the new uh, approach called signal space separation on Max Future, and uh, uh, which can remove this artifact without sacrifice, you know, the and the detection or sensitivity of the brain signal. Uh, we see show a lot, lot, lot experiment, a lot of examples, you know, how this Max Future can help us remove the huge artifact, say, from the vigorous nerve stimulator in a patient with epilepsy, and, uh, and we also use, you know, talk about the the Max Move, you know, which is part of Max Future. We can actually monitor the head motion. That's a very useful powerful tool and uh, in the case of uh, pediatric research of uh, uh, pediatric and uh, clinical MEG data acquisition. And so, you know, for the, the movement compensation, we can recover the signal and uh, use the max move. We talk about the flow chart, you know, how do we get from the beginning to the end with the experiment design, you know, either resting state or evoke design to the MEG data acquisition analysis we'll talk about today and, and the generate report or generate you know on the scientific paper we we'll talk about our research rate and uh, well I think if I have any idea you can you can talk to us we can help you build your protocol yeah we can help you you know run some you know pilot test and uh, even collect some pilot data for future uh, R1 of any you know VA merit any those fundings we offer you discount rate. Of course, when you project get funded, you have the budget in there, uh, you're gonna pay the standard rate, which is in the low end compared with other MEG center. And, uh, and if you are very early in your stage and a young investigator, you develop your career, have no substantial funding, we can offer even further discount. So please talk to us, you know, send me an email, we can uh, work together in the financial protocol and uh, uh, so you can get your pilot data and move on you know, to get your uh, research funding. Well, today, we're going to talk about you know the second topic, which is the MEG uh, forward imaging and MEG uh, inverse modeling. So the MEG forward model and inverse model is defined in the following way. For the forward model, which is in grain, and we try to calculate and uh, if you give me the source uh, location, basically where the sources are, the source distribution, um, and uh, how do I calculate and the, the MEG, you know, MEG uh, field distribution at central domain? So uh, of course, to do that, we need to know no. the, the uh, uh, conductivity, conductivity profile, profile um, of, of the brain. So it's so if you look at the, the, this picture, is from the inside out. If we know the source config, configuration, we know the connectivity profile, we can, we can calculate the MED field distribution at each sensor location and orientation. So that's a problem from the inside out, the MED forward problem. We're gonna talk about today, you know, the very simple uh, spherical MED model. We use that one, you know, for some uh, simple cases and more complicated and uh, more accurate, the boundary element method, uh, almost gold standard for MEG forward calculation. And we can also talk, talk about, you know, and uh, quickly uh, a multi-sphere head model, which is uh, giving you pretty quick calculation uh, with the, the, you know, the um, accuracy similar to BEM. Then we spend a lot of time talking about the MEG inverse modeling. Inverse modeling is 
so so suppose for a specific moment, I take a measurement of MEG signal in such a domain. How do I map into the brain and try to figure out, hey, what kind of neuronal current produce this magnitude measurements? So it's a problem from outside in, and the red arrow, okay? And uh, uh, unfortunately for, for, you know, on the MEG, they show there's, a, the MEG inverse model does not have a, a unique solution. It's what is so-called the U-post problem. And uh, so to make a solution unique, you need to impose additional mathematic or a new physiology constraint. And I will talk about different approach, try to make solution unique by impose different constraint. We talk about, you know, simple dipole fit. And we talk about, you know, the uh, distributed source, you know, with I want uh, an auto norm. We talk about uh, my my approach, which is a spatial temporal L1 norm called Vestal. We also talk about another popular issue with beam former and um, the hypothesis and and the fatal problem go with those uh, uh, beam former uh, uh, and hypothesis. So let's dive in into the MEG forward model. So the goal of the MEG forward model, as I mentioned, if I know a source somewhere in the brain, um, in a simple case, we can approximate the neuronal firing at the, in, uh, in the model what we call the electric current model. Uh, that's equivalent to a tiny, tiny battery. If you think about a tiny battery with two poles, positive and negative pole, right? Imagine you throw the tiny battery in, into, say, a giant uh, conductor, which is the brain, is big conductor, right? Think about you throw the tiny battery into it, like, you know, in the, uh, your bathtub, fill it with salt water, okay? And if you look from a distance, if the dimension of the, of the battery is negligible, then you can treat the, the tiny battery as a dipole, you know, the electric current dipole, and sending the current to the surrounding media. And uh, uh, if the dipole have the uh, dipole moment Q, and by figuring out the relationship between the location and the orientation and strength of the electric current dipole with respect to the uh, location and orientation of the MEG sensor, and which give you the measurement B. And what's in between the G is our forward model. The G factor in the, the location of the source and the, you know, the location of the sensor you know, and the orientation of the sensors. So the whole, the whole purpose is to establish this relationship and tackle the G. And, uh, the goal is try to have a linear relationship between the dipole moment, dipole strength, Q, and which is a linear function of the magnetic dipole, uh, the, uh, the image measurement B. But the strong, stronger the signal in the brain, uh, if the location is fixed, the, the stronger the MEG field pattern uh, from the central domain, you know, and the, what's inside is a four models G. And the different models, you know, uh, the approximate the conductivity profile of the brain. The very simple one is like a sphere, show over here. If you look at this, this structure MR, this is a T1 with the image in MR. You look at, this, this is the head, right? From outside, inward, there's outermost layers, like, you know, the scalp, which is like, you know, you know, on the fatty tissue. What's inside, like a dark, not so dark and dark, like a sandwich. The two darker layer are the compact bone of the skull. What's in the middle is a spongy layer of this of the of the skull to provide the nutrition to support and all the blood supply to support the skull. So what's inside the skull, like a sandwich, you know, dark, not so dark, and dark. And what's on the in innermost skull is our brain tissue. And here we show as the gray matter. So the most important layer of the if, if I try to approximate this complex geometry of the head with a single sphere. The most important surface is a surface you have to jump with the conductivity. That is the innermost skull surface. Okay, in the innermost skull surface, the conductivity jump from something highly conductive, which is the brain, to something like almost like insulator, which is skull. And the conduct the conductivity of the skull is one eightieth, even one uh, one one hundredth of the uh, uh, conductivity of the, uh, the brain tissue is super, super low, right? So uh, if we try to mimic the shape of the uh, of the skull, the innermost layer, which is the, the dark layer, uh, is very important. So, you, you know, here I try to mimic this 
you know, there's this innermost Gauss surface with a sphere, which is shown in this, this case, and the yellow circle. And did, you know, draw a relative good job. Certain parts are not good, you know, but 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 vast majority of the case is not too bad. Of course, the the more accurate approach is called a boundary element approach, the method of BEM. In this case, we can extrapolate the innermost Gauss surface from the structural MRI. And then we translate those ones into small finite element, the small triangles, we call the finite element. And we'll compute the MEG4 model numerically, you know, and that give you, you know, our gold standard, the most accurate you know, MEG4 calculation. So we'll cover both of them, you know, in this lecture. So both of them are insensitive to the uh, conductivity profile. The reason is the, 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 the skull conductivity is so low. You know, there's uh, quite a few papers, including the one from Marty Hamalain and I used to be the director of uh, MEG Center in Harvard uh, or uh, uh, MGH. And he, he did the calculation. If you assume the skull's perfect insulator is conductivity zero, ignore every, anything outside the skull, the error uh, for the MEG calculation is still negligible. You know? So the most important thing is the inverse uh, skull surface. You can approximate with the sphere of BEM. Now some some equations, you know, and if you, you know, don't want to understand this one, fine, you know, and don't don't get don't be bothered by some equations, you know, and, uh, and but uh, I want to make sure you understand the conclusions. So here's the, the beautiful set Maxwell equation. I, th I think the most beautiful set of equations in physics, and describe the, the electric magnetic field, and uh, and the first one is Gauss law. The diverge of E is you know, charge density divided by divided by epsilon zero, which is you know an electric constant constant, and the divergence of V is zero means there's no magnetic monopole. And uh, now we know the Faraday's law. The curve of E is uh, partial B partial T with negative sign. And uh, also we know uh, Ampere's law. The curve of B, the magnetic field, is mu zero, which is a magnetic constant times J, which is which is current current density. At the time, Maxwell constructed those equations, that's all they have. But he realized something must be missing because in curve E, that's the term of partial B, partial T. And uh, in curve B, you have the J, J is due to the, the, uh, you know, the charge movement, you know, the, the current density, right? And there's no J over here in the third equation because there's no magnetic um, monopole, right? You know, and the, uh, but what's missing the last equation as partial E, partial T. He believed there has to be a term and to make the symmetry. So he added a term in there, bingo, that make you know, a revolution. And because of this term, now we have electric magnetic wave. Now we know the light is you know, one form of an electric magnetic wave. You know, without this term, there's no electric magnetic wave. So he put this term at, at that moment for the sake of symmetry. You know. Now for the, for the MEG, we're not dealing with whole set of equation, but dealing with a specific case called a low frequency cost of static approximation. The reason of that, because I mentioned last in, the, in my last lecture, the MEG signal is a low frequency range. Almost 99% of MEG signal is below 100 Hertz, okay? Imagine you have a, you know, electric magnetic wave, travel speed of light, and uh, 300, you know, thousand kilometers in the per, per second. The, the wavelength is extremely large, right? You, you know, when, you, when you, the signal generated from the brain almost instantly reach the signal of the detector with almost no delay, you know? So there's, there's no phase shift from one sensor to the other sensor at this very low frequency range because the electric magnetic wave lands so large compared with distance between the source and the sensors. So in that case, we can ignore partial E, partial T. And the last term in the force equation uh, if that's the case, if I, I take a diverge of the curve, diverge, you take a diverge of curve of any vector, the result has zero. If you, you know, uh, take some classes of the vector um, calculus, you get this result. If you do the calculation, now you realize, you realize and the, the, the last equation become, um, you know, the diverge of current density is zero. That means the total current current density you know, the divergence is zero. That's the equation we are dealing with. And uh, so in the brain, 
we, you know, last time it, we, you know, I, I mentioned there's a neuronal current, that's current of our interest. But I mentioned the image current is insensitive to the action potential, the green one, you know, which is the cancellation left and right, up and down, right? So MEG, like other functional image technology, fMRI, PET, EEG, all the functional image technologies are insensitive to what happened in the white matter. We're all sensitive to what happened in the gray matter. And we're particularly interested in the yellow and red, the post-synaptic current of potential. That can flow a longer distance and allow signal summation. And that's the, our primary current, or JP. So JP is just the yellow and red arrow. That's our primary current. But it's not the whole story. You might see this, that's a, that's a gray line over there. The gray line is it's called a return current because the brain's conductor. If there are any leakage in the cell membranes, the current will return to the synapses, you know, complete a loop. The current had to form a loop, right? And so the obvious JB, this, I only draw two lines. This has many, many lines. It, it, if there's no boundary, this line can go to the infinity. You know, of course, we have boundary with a skull. So the skull can find in the, how, how, far, how far away the, the current can go. But those are current of no interest. Is there only because the brain's conductor has nothing to do with the source. The source is the red and the yellow arrow, which is of JP. So all the, all the forward modeling, I try to get rid of the return current JB so we can establish a direct relationship between energy measurement and JP, okay? So how do we do that? We, we borrow, you know, the very famous Ohm's law, okay? We, we learned that from a high school or, you know, college physics, right? Uh, Ohm's law, in this case, you know, the current, return current, that's the JB equals, and uh, the uh, the gradients of the voltage, not your signs, because uh, it goes to the opposite direction and the one you know, uh, of these uh, of the gradients. And the, the sigma is the, the uh, conductivity. That's nothing but Ohm's law. You know, Ohm's law, we know current equals uh, V divided by R, right? Here is the same thing, you know, current equals V times sigma. Sigma is the conductivity. Conductivity is the inverse of the resistivity. So this equation is exactly the same as the Ohm's law. I equal, R, uh, I equal V divided by R. Now we have J equals, you know, minus sigma gradient V. Remember the previous slide? In the previous slide, I, I showed that the total divergence of total current J has to be zero. You plug those one in, you get this equation. And basically the Laplacian operator, you know, work, you know, working on the electric potential equals the diverge of JP. JP is the primary current divided by sigma. That's great because, you know, the JV disappear because we replace that one with Ohm's law. Now we can solve this equation and, and, and what they call this one, it's like post-sense equation and with some boundary conditions. And if we know the electric potential everywhere, now we can solve, uh, you know, a volume uh, integration equation show over here by the BL sub law, okay? Then we calculate that magnitude B everywhere and the sensor the location and sensor orientation. Unfortunately, uh, and, uh, and when we do that, we can make some approximation. We we'll call it piecewise continuity. And in this case, we are we assume the different brain tissue can be divided in different regions, like scalp, which is sigma three, the region three, skull, which highlight in light blue, that's that's the skull region, region two, and region one is the brain. So we assume within each brain the conductivity is constant. But there's a jump in the value of the uh, conductivity from region one to region two, region two to region three. If we make this piecewise, you know, uh, continuity assumption, we can solve the previous problem, and and that's called, you know, Gaslovitz equation. And of course, it, you know, and you don't remember this with this one, and uh, and and then you can derive the MEG field pattern B, uh, given by uh, Gaslovitz, I believe, nineteen seventy two. So the problem is already solved, you know, and uh, you don't worry about this one. And the, the difficult remaining part is uh, how to seeking um, a numerical solution or is there already a, a special case, a close solution, close format solution for this uh, Gaslovitz equation? Well, the answer is yes. 
Uh, if you make assumption, the brain contains, you know, uh, have a, a spherical uh, a sim uh, you know, symmetry. And you know, the brain can be modeled by, say, the kind of three concentric sphere, brain, skull, and scalp. As I mentioned, because the conductivity of this skull is so low, I can effectively ignore those lines in the uh, MEG and the uh, spherical model. I only look at the single sphere, which is in the innermost skull surface. But the case of EEG, you can have a concentric sphere in uh, approximation. Anyhow, if we make this a specific uh, spherical assumption, assume the head is, is a spherical, then you can solve the problem, uh, giving you a closed form. Because there's a very famous MEG forward modeling and uh, based upon spherical symmetry called the Savas formula. In this case, uh, imagine you can actually you know, model the electric dipole and the electric current dipole, uh, in this case, like a tiny battery with positive negative pole, uh, at the location um, uh, R0 with the dipole moment Q, then you can you can just simply calculate, use the Savas formula, predict the MEG and field you know, at a specific sensor location R in orientation. So in this case, you can see B is a linear equation of Q, but non-linear equation of R0, because there's another function F. F is a complicated uh, function of R0. So from here, we know the magnetic field is a linear function of the of the electric current dipole strength Q, but the nonlinear function of the current dipole location R zero. Okay, so th that's a, you know, and uh, you can simplify this one as B equals some equation times Q. Okay, so the highlight the, the linear relationship between B and the Q, but within G, that contain the sensor location, the source location, and so on. That's nonlinear function. But another surprise. On the uh, uh, conclusion from this equation is uh, I don't see any sigma over here. The conductivity uh, of the brain is nowhere to be found. Wow. And that, that, that's that's very surprise, you know, when he derived this formula and after have a very, very nice consequences. I'll talk about this one you know, on, the, on the next slide. The second you know, consequences of that is uh, assuming you have a dipole, uh, electric current dipole, the point to the radial direction. Imagine you have a sphere, right? Yeah, from the center of the head, point outward. That's a radial orientation. If I was current flow in that direction, if the current direction perfectly flow in the radial orientation, means this Q and R0 are the same direction. If that's the case, we know any vector cross product with itself is zero. But this term disappear. The second term also disappear because Q for the same direction R0, so R0 cross R0, you get nothing. But that's consequences of the second you know, conclusion from the, the Savas formula. Basically, a radio oriented neural current in the perfect spherical MEG model produce zero MEG signal. Of course, you know, the MEG, the head is not perfect sphere, right? So but the still, you know, MEG is insensitive to the neural current flow in the direction of the radial orientation. MEG is very sensitive to the tangential orientation that, you know, on the current neural current. Like if you're uh, doing a sphere cut, a, a spherical you know, coordinate, you have, a, you have a rho, you have theta and phi. Rho is radial orientation, theta is the elevation angle, and the, and the phi is the uh, azimuth angle. You know, MEG field and tangential orientation in the Satan phi are very sensitive to the measurements, but MEG measurement is insensitive to any radio oriented current flow. So that's the second conclusion from this Savas formula. So MEG have a preferred uh, sensitivity to tangential oriented uh, neuronal current. So because the this formula, the sigma is play no role over here, and then some scientists. And from this company called Neuromap, which is built our MEG machine. And they're excited. Hey, if Sigma does not contribute at all to the Savas formula, what if, if I assume um, Sigma zero, 
what can, what can I build an energy phantom? And you know, indeed, that actually worked very well. So in this phantom, there's no con you know, uh, uh, conductivity. You know, when conductivity is zero, the Sava's formula still work. So what's inside the, this uh, spheroid head phantom is a two-circuit two board uh, and filled with hot air, nothing else, right? It's a two-circuit board. And the circuit board does a whole bunch of those, those current dipoles. The dipoles have, you know, goes up in radio orientation and turn 90 degree angle, become a tangential dipole, and then turn back. You see this one dipole 20, radio orientation, you know, and the forward and the 90 degree, you know, that's tangential dipole and then redo oriented inward. There's two radio orientation, out arrow and, you know, an inward arrow, they have no contribution based upon the Savers formula because they are perfect radio oriented source. The only thing contribute to the, you know, image measurement is this tiny tangential dipole over here, dipole 20. So we had a, a phantom 32 dipoles deep in depth they just built on a two circuit board. And that's revolutionary in, my, in the beginning, many years ago, because before the construct this uh, dry phantom, people doing MEG use so-called wet phantom. They have this like you know, spherical like container, you know, like a big giant light bulb filled with salt water. They put actually those those current in the you know, wires in there. And there's a leaking, there's a, you know, erosion, you name it, it's nightmare. But now to come out, it's a brilliant idea. Hey, Sava's work formula worked very well. Uh, even when sigma is zero, yeah, you can build this MEG phantom out of this circuit board. Okay. So, and also many years ago, we also, on, uh, and that time I was uh, finished up my, my I post up. I try to be, a, you know, on the uh, a junior faculty at the University of uh, uh, New Mexico. I finished my post up from Los Alamos Natural Lab, and uh, this is the paper. Uh, you know, uh, when I get out from the lab, my post up work. But that time, you know, computer quite slow, and and try to calculate the boundary element approach. You know, which is the the gold standard. We divided. The, you know, see the innermost Gauss surface into small triangles, solve the Gaslov uh, equation in a numerical fashion. That's, <coughs> excuse me, that's the Gauss standard, but computer quite slow. So in that time, we derive a multi sphere in a model. We compare the accuracy of the single sphere versus uh, three, three layer BEM, and then our improved multi sphere head model with a three layer BEM. You can tell anything. Show you black means, and that specific model deviate from our gold center, the BEM is larger error. Anything showing, you know, yellow and white means the error are actually small. And the left hand side is see that it deepens depth, the difference between single sphere uh, image model versus the gold center BEM. You, you can tell for the vast majority, you know, the parietal area, central sulcus, you know, the occipital region, they are okay. You know, the error actually manageable. But in the prefrontal cortex, you can see in dark, means that there's a, uh, a reduction of accuracy. And uh, between, you know, there's a quite a big different, uh, you know, deviation between single sphere head model versus this, the three shot BEM. In contrast, in the figure on the left hand side, there's a difference between multi sphere head model versus the gold standard in a BEM. You can see that almost everywhere that the error is, is much, much less. The computational cost for the multi sphere almost the same as single sphere. So that time actually is used, you know, a lot by MEG for calculation. Still, some of the packages still use our uh, multi sphere you know, head model. But now we have the fast computer. We also have a very good BEM model. So our research work, which is based on the gold standard, the boundary element method, and which is, I showed before, you know, translate innermost skull surface into small triangles, you know, and the called a you know, uh, boundary element will solve the uh, Gaslov equation, the MEG4 problem uh, uh, numerically. Here's conclusion, you know, the single sphere uh, lead to very quick, you know, simple calculation. Same thing for EEG, you know, I, I didn't show the equation for EEG, 
but the EEG, you know, is way more complicated, you know, and uh, and uh, because the the conductivity play a major role. The conductive the conductivity profile, you know, is the killer for for getting a good EEG head model. But MEG, you can ignore anything outside the innermost cell surface. And that's for MEG, you know, everything sees through. You know, we can get very good, you know, and uh, accurate MEG forward model. And here's the one I'm gonna share with you. Oh, sorry. Uh, research by uh, Hillegrand and, uh, and Barnes and many years ago, they actually shows, you know, sensitivity of MEG. They do the MEG4 calculation with the boundary element method. And they compute, you know, on the, what area uh, is sensitive? Uh, what, what what source conf configuration is sensitive to MEG measurements? Um, anything shown in in blue means if there's a little bit of signal, you know, the MEG sensor will see that means MEG is very sensitive to those those region. Anything shown in red means the source has to be super strong for the MEG sensor to pick it up. Now you can see and. For almost all the entire cor cortical level cortex, and you know, showing actually in, in blue means MEG is very sensitive to those region. There's, I think, the calculate about ninety eight percent, and but you go deeper, and uh, to the brainstem, the thalamus, in those region, you show in red I mean the source has to be super strong for MEG to pick up. So MEG is insensitive, the brainstem and and the, and thalamus in the center of the brain. Well, you also see even in the, in the cortical level, you see some isolated area that's showing yellow, right? And or, or red. That's at the top of the of the gyri when the neurons are actually almost a perfect radio oriented. So in tiny area, you might have some sensitivity issue. You know, the MEG might be insensitive to that. But as long as it has tangential components, MEG will pick up right away. So the conclusions. As MEG sensitive to almost all the cortical level, and uh, but MEG sensitivity going down when you go deeper, typically in the uh, in the in the brainstem and thalamus. Another problem with thalamus is uh, unlike the neural cortex, you know, we, we talk about the the cortical column when the the pyramidal cell, the one generate MEG signal, line up beautifully in parallel, but in the in the thalamus. The neurons are actually like spaghetti; they're, they're totally messed up, you know. And the, you know, so for for thalamus, it's really hard to have the signal summation. That's another reason, MEG is insensitive to thalamus. You know, number one, it's very deep. Number two, the cell orientation like a like a uh, spaghetti. But MEG is very sensitive to all the cortical level and some many of subcortical uh, gray matter neurons like hippocampus and uh, you know, amygdala. Um, the insular cortex, many regions. Uh, I show some examples, you know, later on in my lecture. Now let's jump into the MEG uh, inverse problem. So I need to speed up. So the so I talk about the dipole fit. You know the uh, the leaf field approach, the outer minimum norm and outer minimum norm, uh, which is totally different from the dipole dipole fit. I talk about you know the Westar approach, with the the outer minimum norm solutions. In the dipole fit, we just assume the entire MEG recording can be explained by one or a small number of uh, electric current dipole. In the case, and the unknown parameter to fit those dipole, the, the number of unknown variables is much, much less than the number of measurements. We have 306 sensors. So use the 306 measurement determine uh, several uh, unknown parameters for dipole fit. You're dealing with the uh, over-determined problem. Okay, it got more measurements than uh, unknown variables. So the, and of course that's a noise, you know. But the in, in theory, you, you have you should have a unique solution. Okay, uh, but on the other hand, if I take an imaging approach, if I pre-divide the entire brain into a few hundred thousand up to a million location, as assign each voxel uh, a current dipole. Now I have a Many, many, many dipoles over there, right? The, the number of unknown variables in my brain is so large, much larger than the number of sensors, 306. So we'll talk about the you know the imaging approach, a lead field approach, 
In, in that regard, number of uh, unknown variables much larger than the number of measurements we're dealing with, uh, and you know, an underdetermined problem. This is the opposite. We talk about two approaches: the overdetermined problem and the underdetermined <laughs> problem. And then we'll spend some time on Vestal if we can finish that in time. So here's the a, a simple uh, uh, example, like a median nerve test. I shock my median nerve, and uh, and and then I record uh, my uh, MEG signal. But Twenty milliseconds later, you have the MEG response show over here, and this is a beautiful M twenty. That's a delay from the the peripheral nerve for the signal to travel along peripheral nerve, you know, basically the A fiber through um, spinal cord and go through uh, uh, brainstem, you know, in the thalamus, and then project for the primary uh, somatosensory cortex. When it reaches the cortex, that's delayed 20 milliseconds. You see that this uh, first component is 20 milliseconds later. If you look at the MEG field pattern, you get this very nice MEG field pattern. Look, just one source. If your hand point along the direction of the green arrow, which is your electric current dipole, the rest of the fingers give you the direction of the magnetic field. Going in the brain is blue, out of the brain is red. This top view and the side view, in the in this case, you know, as uh, I believe, as, uh, left median nerve, you know, shock. You have this uh, activity from the contralateral right hemisphere. Yeah, you know, this is side view of the MEG field. So this, this can be approximate approximate model by one electric current dipole, which is a, a talk called tiny battery current battery. Okay. Or two positive poles. Now you can solve the, this uh, MEG inverse problem by, by adjusting the dipole location non-linearly and uh, and in this uh, in this equation. In this equation, the uh, MEG measurement is a linear uh, function of the dipole strength, but non-linear function of dipole location. Through a non-linear search approach, I can find the location. Anytime I move the location, <coughs> I compute the MEG4 model and compare with my measurement. This arrow, I keep searching through. Eventually, I find the best location when my prediction with respect to the measurements is minimized, like a minimum feeding arrow. That's my best feeding solu solution. So in this case, as a nonlinear search, one dipole can be done very easily. So this is the location, you know, there's, uh, the light blue dot with a head point forward. To indicate the location of the current and the orientation of the current, a superimposed on the anatomy. You can see underlying this dark line. This is the very famous feature in the brain called the central sulcus. The posterior bank of the central sulcus called the primary semicentral cortex. That's what's supposed to go. So the location go there exactly. You know, so the median nerve is the most reliable. You know, solutions, and for for the for basically for registering you know the MEG, make sure there's no error. So on almost every single subject, you can do MEG nerve, make sure we get you know good localization because the source is very simple, just one source. The same data set. Now, if you look at later time, not 20 milliseconds. This case, you know, we're looking at 133 milliseconds. Then the field pattern totally changed. Instead of have just one source on top of the parietal lobe, you have to appear to be two sources. You know, they're going down sideways, one on the left, one on the right. So one dipole model will totally fail. Now you need two dipoles. Imagine in the case of a, like a language or working memory test, you can easily have a, a few dozen sources. But the non-linear, the non you know, localization approach is not going to be work very well. So because uh, and the non-linear search is very sensitive to local minima. Your search can be trapped local minima and cannot find a true solution. But in the past, and we we have been we have able to, to fit you know five, six sources with this nonlinear double fit approach. We call the multi-star approach. I show some of the result. But and the overall, you know, nature is uh, for this case, the number of unknown variables is much less than the number of measurements. We're dealing with overdetermined problem, a traditional least square fit. This nonlinear search strategy, in theory, can give you the location of that. And so that, that's the case, you know. So, you know, uh, this example, we use five dipole fit, you know, with the randomly start many, many times, the best solution form five clusters. And uh, 
And that's the on multi star multiple dipole fit approach. That, you know, as part of my you know uh, postdoc work in Los Alamos, and also we superimpose and the anatomy can come from the the, the contralateral primary accessory cortex. Some weak source goes to the primary motor cortex, and some the parietal region and S two area. <laughs> The secondary sensory cortex S2. So if you have a you know a uh, good nonlinear feeding procedure, you can do a nonlinear search. And in this case, five sources, you can still handle that. But more than that would be very challenging, and the searching time will be, you know, sometimes you know not acceptable. So now we we'll switch to you know, if the nonlinear search you can only fit, say, one to five sources. In many cases, we know that more than five sources. Currently in my brain, that's more than one, you know, more than five group neurons are firing. You know, I, I, I'm looking at the screen, I'm talking, my language network, my my sensory motor network, my visual, auditory, all light up simultaneously. So I have many, many sources in my brain. So the, the limitation of the one to five dipole fit have a, need, you know, need some uh, um, uh, improvement. So. One solution to do that is, hey, why bother with uh, you know a few sources? Let me pre-divide the entire brain into many, many voxels, say 10,000, or up to a million voxels. And then I assign each voxel uh, uh, a current dipole. Now I'm dealing with uh, an, a solu solution. The solution is uh, lo locations I already know. Are put over there. You know, either 10,000 or a million. I, I put the dipoles over there. I know the location. The problems become hey, how strong the dipoles are. So each dipole have a basic three orientations and uh, three strengths. But I, I I mentioned that in the MEG case, we are insensitive to the radio oriented source. So the three dipole moment components become two, you know, the two tangential components, the ele elevation angle and the azimuth angle. And so each location does two dipole moment and my, my job is just to determine, hey, how strong is the source are, right? You know, so I can pre-calculate the forward model, establish this equation B equals G times Q, the same as before, but now the Q have, have you know, 10,000 or a million dipoles times two, because each dipole have two dipole moment. And on the left-hand side, F1, the FM, that's my 306 MEG measurements, what's in the middle called the lead view. And each column, as for a dipole location at the uh, the dipole the dipole location at the um, location uh, R one, what is the contribution to the central location at R one? And same thing. And uh, and the last moment is for dipole location R one. What is the contribution of the magnetic field measurements uh, such a location R n? So each column is called a one lead view. That's, you know, if you know, know the location from the one specific dipole, how to calculate the full calculation of the MEG field at each such location. That's exactly the full calculation, right? That can be done pre-hand, you know. And the, so I can pre-calculate this big matrix because I know the location, I know the sense of, uh, orientation, sense of location. I pre-calculate this giant matrix T. And then my question is, for, for given measurements uh, for specific time, you know, on the 306 measurement F1 to FM, how do I calculate dipole strengths Q1 through QP? Okay. But the problem become, uh, you know, complicated because now I only have 306 measurements or 306 equations, but I have a, you know, uh, 10,000 times two or 20,000 or 1 million times so 2 million unknown variables to solve. So I have, the number of unknown variables is much, much larger than the number of measurements or number of equations. Your math plot, uh, professor tell you, oh, you're crazy. You don't have enough equation to uniquely solve those unknown variables. That's exactly the case. The problem becomes you post. And, uh, and also there's not unique solution when you, when you uh, take this, you know, uh, this approach. To make a solution unique, we need to introduce additional constraint. I'm talking about different constraints, you know, and in a moment. So, but it, but now you you know where what we're 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 dealing with. We're dealing with a highly underdetermined problem with 306 sensor location, 
try to determine a few thousand, you know, tens of thousand unknown variables. The different constraints we bring in are the different different source models. And uh, well, I'm gonna pass, you know, what I like this, this uh, saying from Steve Hawking, you know, and he, he said, it, that's why different head model, different source model, sorry, different MEG inverse modeling, different source model have a different, they make different assumption. Some of them may, may make prediction can be verified by experiment, by uh, observation. Some of them just fail to match reality. So the, the way to, to select a good solution with best solution is compare the result with the and the uh, neurophysiology of uh, observations. And the very simple solution, one of them, you know, is so called outcome minimum norm solution. That's the case. So I have a, you know, in this case, three hundred six measurements not sufficient to uniquely determine my all the type of strengths in the entire brain, right? You have 10,000, 20,000 unknown variables. So the just minimize the difference between the MEG prediction and measurements not sufficient. But what if you pick up one solution and minimum power, they call the L2 minimum norm, pick a solution, if you take the double moment Q, you, you square that, sum them up, you get the, the L2 minimum norm, right? You pick up a solution, not only it's, you know fit the data, which will minimize the prediction from the measurement, but also the one with minimum power L2 norm. Then you get a well-known minimum norm solution. So if you are dealing with a linear equation set, with the number of uh, measurements is much less the number of unknown variables, the first thing you should think about it, not only for MEG, but also for, you know, for, for math, of, of for single person, I think the first solution to think about is L2 minimum norm solution. I have a you know very simple solution format called a pseudo inverse or more penrose inverse, and can be easily calculated just like that. You know, you get the solution immediately. You know, but what what is good or not the second story. But you can you can get L two minimum norm solution really really quick. That pseudo uh, inverse or more penrose inverse was originally introduced in the nineteen fifties, and by more and and Penrose. This is the Penrose you know and the win, win Nobel Prize Roger Penrose. Win Nobel Prize in, in 2020. That's its picture. Of course, many probably know him you know, for his contribution to cosmology, his theory of black hole on the you know the creation universe. He, he co-authored multiple paper with uh, uh, Steve Hawking and uh, Stephen Hawking. Of course, uh, Steve died earlier, and uh, but you know, on the Pyros lived a long life. He you know won Nobel Prize. So. Uh, and he also had, you know, make many, many videos, you know, and they see that in, in YouTube, uh, some brilliant videos that talk about, you know, the, the quantum mechanics and the, the human consciousness. You know, some of the ideas are my opening. So, yeah, but this, this is one of his small contributions, you know, more parents the universe when he was in his, uh, in the 50s, you know, when, you know, his early, you know, on the early stage of his, his career. So, if we accept this solution, then solution become easy to compute. Here's a you know paper from a, my colleagues that understand and Eric Hogan. They they did the experiment you know and try to evoke the prefrontal cortex with some tasks. When they solve the MEG inverse problem, they use L2 minimum norm. They call it DSPM solution. And here's the result, uh, a figure C, and you can see that's a big patch. That's the nature of L2 minimum noise solution. The L2 minimum noise solution have a poor, low spatial resolution. Easy to solve, like one line of meta code, basically. You know, and, but the, the result is a big patch. In that paper, they also compare the same test, but using functional MRI, um, which uh, the, the bow contrast. The fMRI result is more sparse, more focal. And then they use the fMRI as a constraint, you know, uh, to the MEG result and uh, figure E as the fMRI constraint L2 minimum noise solution. They have some signal uh, somewhere in between. But if you look at the, the straightforward L2 minimum noise solution, it had the advantage easy to compute, but the disadvantage of a you know, relative poor spatial resolution. Uh, for example, if you, this, if this one, is, is a task to localize the language area, the broadcast area for language expression. You give the whole patch to neurosurgeon. 
he'll be he'll be driving nuts by us by by this by this picture because uh, you know he, that's the this resolution so you know I just uh, covered the entire you know prefrontal cortex you know he cannot operate you know and uh, based upon this one so we needed so, in many cases uh, more high resolution solutions but L two mean more solution easy to compute in many many research project you have you know great applications. So that's the plus and minus of this solution. And uh, I think I want to stop over here. And before I talk about L2, uh, L1 mean minimal solution on Vasto, and I'll leave it on the next lecture next week. And uh, so I see there's a few minutes. Uh, anybody have any, any questions? I see in the chat. Uh... All right, so um, so uh, next lecture we'll, we'll continue cover our uh, forward inverse modeling, and we we're gonna go from the you know, poor resolution L two minimum norm to something much better, and uh, and which was the the one we developed called Vesto, and uh, something highly sparse solution like this, you know, and uh, we we'll talk about this one actually you know, next week, you know, this the Vesto package that uh, under key developer, you know, we welcome people to use our package, you know, and uh, show the hypothesis and the, and the features behind that, you know, and the applications and the sub application for, for example, language localization like this, you know, and the, for this is the language task, you can localize the broadcast area with much, much higher spatial resolution compared with, you can, you can appreciate the resolution from my approach, last step versus, uh, to mean more solution, which is the something, um, yeah, that's a typical uh, situation, you know, but you know, different package, uh, different hypothesis, different approximation. So, so when you use each package, make sure you understand the basic hypothesis behind each model. Um, so we, we, in our center, we give the option to all users, you know, we also, I want also can list. Uh, you know all those uh, the free packages actually and uh, available. You know and uh, this one uh, solution available from the uh, uh, famous MEG package MNE by Hamalainen and other colleagues. Yeah, so uh, the also one next I talk about Beamformer, which is another um, you know and inverse imaging solutions. And yeah, so you try to understand each hat each you know and the uh, uh, solutions hypothesis. Here's a hypothesis is minimize the total power L2 more. You know, for, for my approach, I'm talking about the spatial te temporal L1 minimum norm. Right? And I also talk about the, you know, this uh, beam former hypothesis next week. And so next week, I'm also cover uh, some clinical application on epilepsy and also um, pre-surgical functional mapping. See you next week. You're welcome to send me emails, you know, and you want to start a new project with us, please contact us. We're always there, you know, for you and help you and uh, set up the ideal MEG protocol and help you acquire data and uh, you know, move forward on, on, on your research projects. So I'm gonna talk about, you know, the MEG clinical application and some of the, continue some of the MEG inverse modeling uh, next week. Uh, thank you so much. See you ne uh, next week, the same time. <laughs>